Thank you very much uh, for a very kind introduction, uh, Mahendra. Uh, this is uh, uh, my, uh, very much my uh, honor to be invited here to present my, my perspective on the maritime security uh, of, of Japan and also of the regional interest. So uh, without further ado, I, I'd like to get straight into the topic. I think uh, we've been hearing so much about the increased naval activities of China in both uh, East Asia and also in the Indian Ocean region as well. So oftentimes the maritime security, especially in uh, you know, popular webinars by major think tanks in the United States, have been discussed in terms of uh, naval rivalry, especially uh, the rivalry of a binary mode between the United States on one hand and, and China on the other and other actors like Japan, Australia are kind of subsumed into this binary framework as allies of the United States. And, and India has been also uh, discussed within the context of uh, the quadrilateral cooperation, although Oftentimes, discussion of India comes with uh, some reservations and, and question marks about its uh, full prospect for participation in the so-called anti-China coalition. I try to make things a lot more complex. <laughs> and I uh, have to apologize for that first, because, uh, you know, the kind of picture I draw is never as clear as the one you might draw from, uh, you know, people like Mearsheimer. And I, I'm very skeptical of uh, the kind of sy system level analysis. And I, I don't deny the system level forces, but uh, I'm also very much aware of the nuances of each national policy of uh, Indo-Pacific region countries. And those include not only Japan, India, and Australia, but uh, uh, many Southeast Asian countries, for example. And that's one modifier I take into account. The other modifier I take into account is the broad perspectives of maritime security, not only in terms of uh, uh, national actors, but maritime security in terms of the issues concerned beyond naval rivalry. And this comes with my background of somebody who spent a lot of time playing in the ocean. I, you know, my first hobby was fishing. So, <laughs> and, you know, I still do it. And actually I claim another PhD in fishing. <laughs> the other hobby is, uh, is windsurfing. I am a sailor and I used to compete in, uh, uh, intramural college competition in, in Japan for many years. And I've, I have a couple of titles as well. And, and recently I got back into sailing competition again. So uh, I'm a lifetime lover of ocean, anything to do with ocean. And because of this, I, I look at the maritime issues very broadly beyond maritime uh, naval rivalry. 
So the one of the big issues I look at is is a fishery issue. And I I have done research in international fishery management. I have done research in anti-piracy co cooperation, and both of which are often considered non-traditional security issues. The kind of issues which involve more than state level actors, more than just national governments, a lot of private actors, a lot of subnational uh, public policy issues. So I, I tend to look at maritime security in this broadest possible spectrum of issues. So my talk is actually quite different from uh, the typical talks on maritime security you might hear from other think tanks and so forth. But having said that, I think it's always helpful to start with the basics. <laughs> so I, I will start talking about maritime naval competition issues a little bit before moving into other topics. And uh, oh, it seems I... Uh, I, I need the uh, authority to uh, share the screen. If you could enable that, about that. Okay. Well, let me first give a kind of big perspective, big futuristic perspective. Why Indo-Pacific maritime security is essential for Japan? And one of the big reasons is because this region is gonna be the center of world economy. It already is, if you look at the three economic blocks, uh, East Asian block represented by blue, it's, uh, already uh, uh, getting bigger than the European Union or the North American bloc. So, and this trend is, is likely to continue with the continuing growth of China uh, and also perhaps more importantly in the, in the midterm, the ascent of India getting close to China surpassing the United States by sometime the middle of this century, according to some predictions. So this block, the Indo-Pacific economy will be the biggest in the world. And Japan's relative share will shrink. If you look at the 2050 figure, Japan descends to number eight economy in the world. Presently, it's number four, uh, according to the purchase power parity adjusted figure, but Japan will descend to number eight. But nevertheless, the whole region is gonna be a big block and Japan find its own survival in this block, critical interest. And as long as the region is peaceful, Japan can enjoy this economic prosperity of the region. But if the region becomes unstable security-wise, then uh, economic benefit cannot be enjoyed. So security in this region is very important. And trade depends on seaborne trade through various sea lanes which has been uh, historically protected by the presence of the US Pacific Command and its operations into the Indian Ocean region. 
the US restructured its command, now it's called US Indo-Pacific Command, still headquartered in Honolulu, Hawaii. The host of sea lanes in this region uh, is critical for Japan's trade westward. From Japan, the sea lane goes through the East China Sea, then the South China Sea, pass through one of the three major straits connecting the Western Pacific with the Indian Ocean. And all of those straits involve uh, Indonesia. The Malacca Strait goes between Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia. The Sunda Strait runs between two Indonesian islands of Sumatra and Java. Then the Lombok Strait again runs through two Indonesian islands of Lombok and Bali. So obviously in Southeast Asia, Indonesia is one critical country for the sea lane security. And the sea lane is used by all of the, the big economic powers of the region, Japan, China, and South Korea. All of them more or less depend on energy imports coming from the Middle East and North Africa. So the Indian Ocean sea lane security is very important. The choke point security in Southeast Asia is very important for all three actors. Before the rising neighbor rivalry between China and the United States, since around 2010 or so, there was a period in the late 90s during which several countries were very concerned about the increasing incidence of piracy in Southeast Asia, especially the Malacca Straits, but some other areas of South, Southeast Asia as well. I remember when the United States was talking about uh, sending uh, uh, high-speed patrol boats with Navy SEALs or the Marine commandos on board into the Malacca Straits to deal with piracy incidents. The littoral states of Malaysia and Indonesia bitterly opposed such initiative and they instead quickly uh, put together a plan for a coordinated patrol among Singapore, Indonesia, and Malaysian navies and coast guard. The cooperation was done in a way to preempt the US involvement into the security of this international strait. By the way, Malaysia and Indonesia, they claim uh, national sovereignty over crime issues in this strait. So for them, it's a kind of sovereignty issue, very sensitive one. Although the strait is declared international, so it has to stay open during peacetime and wartime, according to the international law. So this is the legal status of the Malacca Straits really complicated the uh, counter piracy operations back then. But even back then, 
late 90s, I heard several analysts saying in public, well, oftentimes not so public in private conversations, that, well, 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 big powers all trying to get involved in uh, straight security. This is not about piracy, is it? So people were sensing the growing rivalry between major naval powers, especially China and the US. And they noted the importance of control over the key choke point, straight security. This became even clearer during the early 2000s, post 911. Some of you might remember, you know, just one year after the 911, the, there was a terrorism incident on the island of Bali. The, the terrorist group called Jamaya Islamia bombed the discotheque on the island of Bali, killing a lot of Australian tourists, American tourists, European tourists, Japanese tourists, and local uh, the visitors to the discotheque. And after this incident, the United States got very seriously uh, interested in uh, terrorism and the terrorist use of maritime space for their uh, various illicit activities, including uh, smuggling, um, uh, trafficking, and also uh, uh, illegal entries into the neighboring countries. So, so if you see uh, on this map of sea lanes, you can see uh, the sea lane coming through the southern part of the Philippines, going through the, the channel between the island of Borneo and the island of Celebes, and going through this narrow channel, the sea lane goes down to the Lombok Strait. The Lombok Strait is a very important strait because uh, the biggest super tankers cruise through this strait. They avoid the Malacca Strait, which is narrow, shallow, and winding. So the biggest super tankers comes to the Lombok Strait heavily used by Japanese, Chinese, Koreans. But it's also important for US naval operations. After the, the terror incident in Bali, the US, Australia, they discussed the security issue and coordinating their security assistance to Indonesia by focusing on this region. The, Japan was very active in ensuring uh, safe passage through the Malacca Strait from even from the 1960s. So after the piracy started rising, Japan could easily enter cooperation with Southeast Asian countries, whereas the United States was viewed with skepticism by some other countries. But US and Australia took an initiative in the, the Makassar Strait, the Celebes Sea between the island of Borneo and Celebes. And they, uh, they provided the patrol capability to the Indonesian Navy through their joint uh, coordinated assistance. And what Indonesia did 
using the US aid. Indonesia, in the name of maritime domain awareness, they installed radar sites on the east coast of the island of Borneo, directly looking into the, the Celebes Sea. Is that for monitoring small boats trafficking terrorists between southern Philippines and Indonesia? Or is it about monitoring other countries' naval vessels, presumably Chinese ships going down south through this channel? You can do both with the same capability. It's a dual use. And in the name of counterterrorism, the naval rivalry in assisting Southeast, Southeast Asia and littoral states was already taking place immediately after the, the 911 and the turn of the century. So it is in this context that the growing Sino-US rivalry at sea in the Western Pacific and then gradually into the Indian Ocean region was evolving. The piracy migrated to the the seas around Somalia. Yeah. It's not that Southeast Asian pirates decided to move out of Southeast Asia and started operating off Somalia. It wasn't like that. It is a Somali pirates who was there even before, but didn't catch as much attention. They weren't as active, that is true. Some of them used to be fishermen, but because of uh, poor fishing, they turned into uh, piracy for their living. Well, by late 2000s, 2008, 2009, the piracy became more common in this area. And again, this caught attention of major naval powers. The US sent its patrol boats, naval ships, European Union sent its ships, Russia sent its ships, China sent its ships, Japan sent its ships, all to patrol this water. Some in coordinated task force, joint task force, some acting unilaterally. The small country, Djibouti, facing the Gulf of Aden. Djibouti, is a host to three major naval bases, Japan, China, and US. For Japan, since the end of the World War II, it is the very first overseas military base Japan has. Very first and the only military base Japan has outside. Japan and the US more or less share the same property. It's right next to each other. And China put its own base where they have a good view of the American and Japanese operations. So Djibouti has become a ground for uh, competition among those countries, three countries. Yeah. Again, is this about pirates? 
Why is, is this about a straight control? It could serve dual purpose. The key straight is a perfect place to monitor the movement of ships. Today, you know, Russia is uh, trying to invade Ukraine. Ukrainians are fighting back quite successfully. Russia, not only, uh, you know, having difficulty on the ground, but even its naval ships in the Black Sea have been uh, attacked by Ukrainian forces and, you know, some sinking of Russian ships has happened. Well, Russia, they, they are sending some transport ships from Far East. Couple of ships left Vladivostok. The Japanese took a very clear picture of the ship and its cargo and, you know, shared the intelligence with the U.S. So that's possible because Russian ship has to, has to go through a narrow channel between the Japanese islands in order to get to the open Pacific. And the ship will have to go through the narrow straits in the Southeast Asia before getting into the Indian Ocean. And in order to get into the Mediterranean, they have to go through, again, narrow channel into the Red Sea, Suez Canal, and then from Mediterranean into the Black Sea, it has to go through Bosporus, you know, right through Turkey's territory. So Russian ships are completely visible to close monitoring by uh, friends and allies of the United States, which will share intelligence and eventually such intelligence will aid Ukrainian uh, resistance against Russia. So, so the maritime security in terms of naval rivalry yeah, is uh, very much focused on the control of uh, key sea lanes and, and choke points on those sea lanes. Yeah. And this is universal. It's not only America and its allies who has that kind of thinking. You know, China thinks right, likewise. So, you know, China's Belt and Road Initiative, you know, it, it's about connecting key ports and securing sea lanes. China talks about the uh, development of port infrastructure and emphasize its economic objectives. But such infrastructure can be used for security purposes as well. And if you are watching the development in the South Pacific, China just announced that uh, it has uh, the naval port opening in the island of Solomon and China is deploying a kind of special police force to the island of Solomons. So the militarization by major powers 
in this region already happening. So, yeah, let me skip some of those. Uh, but from Japan's perspective, the trade routes in the Indian Ocean region is important, partly for the access to the Middle East oil. So from the Indian Ocean, the separate sea lanes go through the Strait of Homs into the into the Persian Gulf and securing the, the petroleum crude oil and also uh, the li liquefied natural gas LNG imports from Gulf countries is a very critical economic interest for Japan. Uh, some energy import from North African country requires safe passage through the Red Sea. And if you remember uh, about a year ago or so, one Japanese uh, commercial vessels blocked the, the Suez Canal passage uh, because of a very strong wind and uh, navigation error. So uh, the canal closed, remained closed for a couple of weeks and it caused a major economic damage to, to, to the company and to Japan as well as other users of the Suez Canal passage. So this is a very important trade route for Japan. The, the U.S. used to be the guarantor of all these maritime trade routes, but the U.S. can no longer do everything on its own. So Japan's gradually uh, getting into uh, the security business over the maritime areas still in, very much in cooperation with the United States, but also uh, uh, Japan is developing new cooperative ties with other partners. And in the Indian Ocean region, India is the prime partner for Japan. The other European actors, French, British, they are coming into the region. And I think Australians also uh, have made up their mind that they're going to participate in both the Pacific Ocean security and the Indian Ocean security. They are having internal debate, but in the end, I think the, the scholars in Perth Western Australia, they, they got their voices heard in Canberra. So, so those are the major participants in the Indian Ocean region, maritime security. They are interested in both non-traditional security concerns, including pirates and terrorists, if you remember the post 911, Japan sent its uh, maritime self-defense force vessels to the Indian Ocean region, to the Arabian Sea mainly. And the Japanese ships were, uh, it, it's a formation of a destroyer ship, which escorted, uh, refueling ship and uh, the re refueling ship was basically providing uh, uh, the fuel for the coalition navy ships the u.s ships and other countries 
uh, vessels, including the Europeans and uh, Australia, New Zealand. All of, all of them were patrolling the, the area against the smuggling activities by Taliban and Al Qaeda. So we still see the extension of that in the name of uh, the anti piracy patrol. And Japan has again its patrolling destroyer, also uh, the aircraft based in Djibouti, uh, taking part in anti piracy operation. But in addition to that, Japan has sent a separate ship to uh, respond to the rising tension between Iran and the United States, especially during the, the Trump administration of the United States, which walked away from the nuclear deal with Iran and opted for uh, the kind of pressuring approach against Iran. Since Biden came, the US and Iran uh, resumed the nuclear talk and the tension has somewhat subsided, but, uh, but at the request of the United States, Japan did dispatch an additional ship to the region. So that's how important the, the sea trade in this region is for Japan. The disaster relief and protection of its own nationals in the region could be a part of the maritime security for Japan. The Indian Ocean tsunami back in the early 2000s uh, resulted in a large number of deaths in the region and the maritime search and rescue activities were very closely coordinated by US Navy, Japanese Navy, Australian Navy. And the India actually was uh, also a part of this uh, networked cooperation among the neighbor powers. China was not. China still didn't have a long distance neighbor dispatch capability back then. So uh, the cooperation between US, Japan, Australia, India uh, back then was the, the first step toward the later uh, formation of uh, quad quadrilateral cooperation among them. Okay, so uh, let me just skip this and yeah, let me change the file now and talk more specifically about the South China Sea. Okay, uh, the maritime security can be defined in terms of resources, transport use of the maritime space, and also a security. And they are somewhat overlapping. I'm not going to go into a detailed explanation about international law of the sea. I am, I'm pretty sure you are already familiar with the concept of territorial water and exclusive economic zone and so forth. So I'll skip that. But basically China is claiming the entire South China Sea. And 
Chinese claim has no basis in the existing international law. China cites some historical uh, use of this water, but you know, China can hardly establish the exclusive use of such water. So the, even if China was using this water for a long time, it was not the exclusive use. Therefore, you know, uh, Chinese claim is far from uh, having any roots in the international law. So many small reefs, islands, rocks, some features are constantly above water. Some are submerged at high, high tides. There's thousands of those features in the sea. And the ownership of many of these features are contested by several Southeast Asian countries and China. So as a result, it, it's a very complex multilateral dispute. But everybody's claim dispute with China because China is claiming everything. You can see national flags indicating which country is currently in control of those features. Several battles took place after the Vietnam War and you know the Chinese troops got uh, into fighting against the Vietnam, against the Philippines, and, and grabbed the control away from those countries. The fishing boats activities in the dispu disputed water yeah, has caused in several incidents of sinking after the, the Coast Guard boat rammed the fishing boats. China has done that, but uh, in the southern part of the South China Sea, where the Indonesian control is somewhat overlapping with Chinese claim, Indonesia has uh, confiscated some Chinese fishing boats and, and burned them, as you see in the picture on the right bottom of this slide. So uh, the area is prone to uh, escalation of conflicts through those uh, law enforcement activities by uh, disputing parties. The disputed water is likely quite rich in seabed resources, the uh, oil and gas deposit uh, being tapped by coastal states. But some coastal states, they cannot do it unilaterally because they don't have capital, they don't have technology, their military is too weak to protect the oil rig, gas rig, or the transportation cost to their own country from, from the maritime uh, oil field, gas field is too high to be profitable. So there are many reasons which encourage those countries to enter joint development with other partners. 
And I'm specifically talking about the Philippines, which has been seduced by China into joint development activities. Yeah. Vietnam has been very cautious against any kind of joint development with the Chinese, except in the area where the border is more clearly demarcated. Instead, Vietnam has been uh, soliciting partnerships with non-Chinese partners, including the US companies, Russian companies, and Indian companies, so that China cannot easily bully Vietnam over those operations. Sometimes it is China which offers joint ventures and the Philippines has been uh, often uh, approached by China, but in the East China Sea, China even approached Japan to do a joint development after the, uh, the gas development by China in the disputed area was bitterly protested by Japan. But uh, Japan did not accept Chinese offer because China proposed joint development in multiple areas. One of them was in the disputed area and two other projects were in some other area where Japan sovereignty was much clearly established. So, uh, so Japan rejected the package offer. So uh, uh, the joint venture in the maritime domain can come with many different objectives. This is an important point in the East China Sea. It will be very important in a few years. There is an area Japan, Korea established as a joint development zone. And it does seem that uh, the oil and gas deposit in the area will soon be tapped. But it will be tapped after Japan-Korea joint development agreement expires. Agreement has existed for many years, but it was not utilized for many years. When the agreement expires, a new development is expected. So I'll just skip that. Uh, I already showed this, uh, see, uh, yeah, can skip that here. The South China Sea significant is, significance is not only about oil and gas in the disputed area and issues between Southeast Asian countries and China, but it's also about the use of sea lanes for countries like Japan. And it's also about China's geopolitical nuclear strategy and the US effort to counter that. China wants its uh, nuclear armed submarines to have a safe haven. And South China Sea is ideal space. In the East China Sea, you know, the Japanese archipelago is blocking the Chinese naval activities and the US has a uh, true presence in Okinawa, the southern uh, part of Japan. Whereas in the South China Sea, the Philippines at the end of the Cold War passed a new constitution which basically prohibits 
presence of permanent foreign base. So the U.S. cannot establish a major military presence on the island of the Philippines. And the other Southeast Asian countries, none of them is a treaty ally except Thailand. But of course, Thailand is not a major uh, naval power. So China has a better chance of securing the South China Sea through militarily and through diplomatic uh, kind of uh, positive and negative inducement toward the Southeast Asian countries. China has a naval base on the island of Hainan, and that's China's major submarine base. U.S. patrol plane got a little close to the Hainan Island in 2001 and collided with the Chinese fighter plane. And the fighter plane went down and American patrol plane made an emergency landing on the Chinese base on Hainan. It became a major diplomatic incident between U.S. and China. And China didn't return the U.S. airplane until after uh, made a very thorough research about it. So a lot of uh, uh, confidential information was likely to be obtained by China at that time. So, so the South China Sea is a very sensitive uh, the nuclear strategy related conflict between China and the United States. This is a picture from the Chinese base. You can see that the China has deployed its newest nuclear, uh, strategic nuclear submarines and also attack submarines to protect those strategic submarines. Okay. China has been building up on those reefs in the South China Sea and militarizing them. If China continues to do that, then it will become more difficult for the U.S. to deploy its Navy ships into the region or fly a uh, long distance bomber into this region. So other countries are, are very closely watching if China will achieve such a air superiority over the South China Sea and possibly declare the air defense identification zone over the South China Sea to restrict the flight by uh, the military airplanes of the US or Japan or other parties. So the US insists on freedom of navigation through the South China Sea and deny China's territorial claim over uh, the South China Sea. Yeah. US is not challenging the particular uh, ownership of any specific land features. When there is a dispute, US says it's neutral, but when China reclaims an uh, underwater reef and build a military base on it and start claiming territorial water around the artificial island, then the US challenges Chinese 
claim through international law and through the, the naval transit activities. Other countries are also working with the Americans, the French, British, Australian, Japanese, they're all dispatching naval ships into the South China Sea. And in recent years, the Indian Navy also uh, uh, makes uh, entries into the South China Sea. Some of them are not necessarily going inside the 12 nautical mile of Chinese controlled land features, but the Americans often do that. Yeah. If the land feature is not a properly recognized island as such. Yeah. All right. A little too much detailed international law talk on this slide, but uh, you know, oftentimes the the journalists use the term FONOPS, freedom of navigation operations, but uh, the precise definition of such doesn't really exist, and U.S. operations. Uh, categorized into uh, you know, the different types of legal challenges against the Chinese claims, whether spoken or unspoken. Yeah. Okay, so I think I should stop. And if you have some questions, maybe we have a little time to do a Q&A. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you have covered uh, everything uh, very comprehensively. Nothing left for the questions. But uh, <laughs> I will ask the students to uh, uh, ask questions. They may have their own queries, particularly about the uh, Indian perspective, uh, this maritime security issue in this region. So now uh, the students should come up with their questions. Introduce yourself and your questions. Come on. Yeah. Am I audible, sir? Hello. Hello. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you, sir, for such insightful session. It was one. Uh, it was very detailed. And uh, I'm Anishka. I'm a final year mass media student. Uh, so my question is uh, might seem very basic, but uh, what like how do you think the uh, the relation between Japan and uh, India has evolved over the years? Like tracing it to the history, like and now how the change in dynamics has shaped these relations in relation to maritime security and other diplomatic perspectives. Okay, thank you very much. I think India will be one of the most important partner of Japan in maritime security. I think their interests are quite convergent. India does not want to enter uh, alliance with the United States. Indian strategy, I think, has an element of hedging, but having said that, I think India understands that Chinese presence in the Indian Ocean region will grow and India cannot unilaterally balance against that. So in that context, the best Indian strategy can hope for is to line up other navies to be present in the Indian Ocean region so that they can help India balance against China. Okay. So, so I think this kind of a uh, kind of multi-polar presence 
in the Indian Ocean region is something India uh, likes to see. And, and I think Japan does understand very clearly that India cannot ally with the United States and India cannot turn Quad into an alliance as such. So understanding that, Japan basically accept India's limitation and try to work within that limitation to the best of both uh, India and Japan's mutual interest. And historically, you know, the two countries have had good relations, you know, even since, since before the World War II, you know, India and Japan, uh, they have had no, no problem. And Japan has shifted the economic assistance away from China into India and you know, India's development uh, and Japan's economic diversification strategy are also in agreement. And now Japan is shifting, you know, within India, Japan's uh, uh, diverting some of the aid into the development of Indian Northeast, which is consistent with India's security strategy. So, uh, so I think two countries are very well cooperating uh, in, in those regards. Any other questions? Yes, come on, be quick. Yes, any other question? Come on. We can't detain our guest for a long time. <laughs> uh, he has already explained things in very detail. Uh, still, you may have your own queries, and uh, uh, I think uh, we will satisfy uh, all your queries. So, Professor Sato, uh, let me uh, close this session with your permission. And uh, before that, I would like to once again uh, thank you very much uh, for sparing time and such a you know, uh, long and very exhaustive uh, uh, exposition of issues relating to maritime security, uh, particularly in this area where India is also uh, concerned. And uh, India-Japan cooperation in the field of maritime security is very, very vital. Of course, it will not be in the shape of an alliance, but, uh, you know, Quad has to a certain extent uh, uh, relieved India's tensions. Uh, and, uh, uh, the bigger uh, threat is from the other side, from China. So I think uh, without going to an alliance, uh, India can uh, safely uh, focus on its own security issues and all that. So once again, I thank you. And uh, we hope to have your guidance and uh, uh, the views on various issues relating to uh, such issues. Uh, and with that, uh, uh, I would like to close this session with your permission. And before that, I would like to make an announcement to the students that uh, I have put uh, an uh, updated uh, uh, schedule on LinkedIn. Uh, for 1st of April, there is another uh, guest. And for 6th of April, there is another guest. So they will also be speaking. So that completes, you know, the complete schedule of uh, the lecture schedule. So thank you very much, sir. And uh, with your permission, I would like to close this. Uh, we have ex almost exhausted you. We have <laughs> put you a lot of, you know, <laughs> I mean, we have tested your stamina. At this stage, I mean, of your life, I mean, you are so widely, I mean, lively, <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, person that uh, really, and your work, <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I mean, by your speeches, or webinars, articles, new channels, 
I mean, something which one cannot even think of. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Namaste. Thank <laughs> Namaste, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.